Okay, everybody ready? Uh, my name's Scott McAvoy, I'm the Vice President of Operations of the Marbridge Foundation in Austin, Texas. Happy to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Recording and Together for Choice. I'm also on the board of Together for Choice. Also on the board of Together for Choice. I am here today to facilitate a conversation about residential and housing options. And we're here to kind of have a discussion with three questions in mind. Um, and we got a lot of nice, smart folks in the audience, a lot of different models. Um, just heard Jill talk about a very underserved population. We, t we heard her talk about some very profoundly affected folks who, um, who live with autism and the lack of resources as out there for them. So there's some folks in the room who serve them now who, will, who are gonna speak up. The questions that we're facilitating the answers to hopefully here is, the first one is what opportunities do we have as uh, providers and producers of housing and residential services? The second are gonna be what are barriers, threats, and concerns with what's coming up down the pike? And the third is what are the possible solutions, the best possible solutions to address that second question? And I'm just gonna lead off, I'm gonna describe the foundation that I work for, um, the people I serve. So Marbridge, uh, I'm gonna be very quick with this because we've got very limited time, but Marbridge is founded in 1953 by family members, not unlike a lot of organizations that are out there in the U United States. Um, they found it for their son, Jim. Um, it was Marge and Ed Bridges, hence the name Marbridge. Um, we have a campus with 200 acres, beautiful, rolling Texas hill country. Um, we serve 250 adults, um, all with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we serve them in kind of a continuum of care, focusing on a level of independence. Now, what we don't do, we don't take waiver money at the moment. Uh, we get questioned quite a bit by that. You know, our families say, okay, I've come to the top of, by the way, Texas has 100,000 people waiting for waiver services. It takes 15 years to get to the top. Some of our families go, why, why can't I use it for Marbridge? Um, I don't want to take my loved one out of Marbridge. Uh, it's because, uh, as we all heard, Marbridge is considered an institutional facility, not unlike Misericordia. It's considered congregate, segregated care. Um, and we integrate our residents into the community. We integrate the community into Marbridge. But again, we have a three care communities. Uh, one serves people of lower functioning, they get the supports they need to successfully uh, negotiate the smaller campus and get in the community with staff with them. We have an independent community, the village, where the residents have learned how to skillfully negotiate the larger community without paid staff with them. And we have a very unique, kind of like Misericordia, we have a skilled nursing facility. So a person, if they still choose or want to, they can come into Marbridge at age 18 and stay to the end of life. Skilled nursing facility is our villa, and it's, uh, it was built in the 80s, so kind of along the same lines as Misericordia. We also have people being served in the community independently, living in their own apartments. Again, our goal is to help a person be as independent as their abilities allow. So looking at that a continuum of care, we have opportunities. We could probably use the waiver to serve folks that are considered uh, community-based, those ones living in apartments. We could probably get group homes. Um, that, those are opportunities for us. Um, but we also want to make sure funding's available for them. We also want to make sure that those regulations aren't so prescriptive that it goes against our mission and that we're spending more time filling out documents and versus uh, um, just doing what we can to help the residents, spending time, giving them the care we need and their direction they need, looking for jobs and making sure that they're being supported adequately where they're living. So those are opportunities we have at Marbridge. The barriers and threats are, like I say, you know, um, a lot of, uh, we have a great reputation in Texas and around the country, but we've got organizations, um, Disability Rights is one of Texas, who considers, again, segregated institutional care. So any, any, anything that has the Marbridge name attached to it, that's kind of a threat, and they consider it an institution. Um, concerns are, the, if we branch out to take waiver money, that license is a little different than we're now using to serve our residents on the campus, and that's gonna be a lot more prescriptive with a lot more hoops to jump through, and again, I fear that the focus is gonna be on getting the Medicaid money and not taking care of the residents. What are possible solutions to address that? Um, this is why we don't serve waiver right now, but we've been um, talking about it, we've been getting uh, groups, especially families, advocating 
Uh, a couple of our families have come to the top of the list and come to us and say, why can't I use wave of money at Marbridge? And I said, well, because again, we're considered a congregate care institutional, but do not get off that waiver lift, fight for your spot. So a couple of them are fighting and successfully so. So I wanna open up these three questions. What opportunities do we have? What are the barriers and threats and concerns? And what are the possible solutions to address number two? So free speaking, does anyone wanna talk about their individual programs and communities? So for us, we, uh, I, we serve 36 adults um, with what would be considered profound um, multiple impairments. So both cognitive and IDD, but also with physical disability. Um, and we're very active in the community, but like, like your organization, same thing. Because we are congregated in one area, um, there's an opposition. I do believe, though, that um, that there is an opportunity here to together talk about the civil rights issue um, of being able to be, because without the care that we provide, many of the men and women we serve would be in nursing homes, which would be even more restrictive. So the HCBS, if, if that were to somehow close us down, which I, I don't believe it's going to do, um, it would actually be more restrictive for the individuals. Um, and I think that that's an opportunity for us to talk about is a lot of us provide care that's on a, on a profound end of, of the spectrum that is, uh, you know, that is for the individuals that are, are um, could be eligible for, for the institutions or, or that sort of thing. And I also think the other thing is that we need to just be transparent. Semantics, that sort of thing, I, I don't think that that has been effective. Um, we are co-located, we, you know, we are disability specific, um, and I think we have to own that. Um, but there are reasons for it, and, and there are um, advantages for the men and women we serve. Absolutely, thank you. Anyone else? My name is Jack Kosick, and I'm one of the co-founders of an organization in Florida called Noah's Ark of Central Florida. Um, first and foremost, I'm a dad. Same question, what's going to happen to our daughter? God calls us home. Back in 1997, we did research, said we, we, we tried to find out what was going to happen, where my daughter's path was for her life, and it wasn't good. We started an organization. Um, Started small, we got a local church to help us. They bought three lots, we built three homes clustered together in the city of Lakeland to show what we could do and started to get some experience in housing and all this other stuff. City of Lakeland saw what we were doing, they donated to a 56 acres of ground to us to be able to do a community because we wanted to, we had this vision of building a community that had a clubhouse and activities and everything else. Um, back in 2013, we got awarded uh, $15 million from the state of Florida through the F Florida Housing Finance Corporation for an IRS program. It's low-income housing tax credit. It's available in every state. Don't jump at it because it's really complex. But we, they gave us $11 million through the tax credits, and we had $4 million worth of grants and so on and so forth. And we built a community right now in North Lake and called the Villages at Noah's Landing. Some of you have been there. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible community. We are, have 126 residents in that community, another 20 residents in uh, six homes that we own outside that community. Um, we don't provide direct services. We have individuals that we do have Medicaid waiver and it was threatened by CMS that they were gonna withhold funding for services in our larger community. Um, and we just, we kept charging forward. And it says, well, how'd you get past this thing? We recently had a visit by the PNA people, the disability rights in Florida, they said they were just going to stop by and visit to see how things were going. Six hours and 15 minutes with me. They went through all the heightened scrutiny questions, and they gave us a glowing, two glowing reports on how well we did. Again, we're not, we're not providing the services. We're allowing the people that have Medicaid waiver services to provide the, pick out their own people, and we also allow families to come in because we want to be more affordable. We're not private pay. Um, 
So that's how, how we sort of approached it. We seem to be doing okay. The, 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 I don't say the residents, I want to call them kids. They love it there. They're having a really great time. They're, they're, the growth that we see is wonderful. Yes, we've had some more threats in, well, geez, we don't want to do that again because we think it's too big. Well, if they came out and we had a group complain about some of the things we were doing and how we were doing it. And so we've had visits by the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, by ACA, Agency for Healthcare Administration, by the public and advocacy people, by the Department of Children and Family Services, and everybody walks away saying, wow, this place is great. We need more of them like that. So I think by having a, a program like that where you can look at that and say, here's what we're talking about doing. It's done successfully. People can live in our community for somewhere around $1,300 a month, which is a lot lower than a private pay kind of thing. But there are some problems with that because people expect, we have some families that expect a whole lot more. Some, some of those families want you to be babysitters, call them every time something happens. So some people, families come in and drop off their kids. So there's some threats there where the families will come in and say, well, we'll be there. We heavily rely on volunteers for our activities. We have an activity calendar that looks like a, a country club. It works, it's hard work. I have four Ps, I call it the four Ps. You have to have patience, perseverance, perspiration, and politics. All of those have to hand. We started in 1997, it took us 20 years to get where we are today. We had to break down barriers, we had to get funding directed, all sorts of wonderful things. It's all possible, but you all have to stay focused on what the prize is and what you want to do. In our situation, yeah, had we tied in services, because we actually, my wife and I actually had a separate company that wasn't tied to Noah's Ark that was to provide the services as sort of a safety net if we needed to use it. And there was so much red tape and stuff that went with it, we just closed it. It wasn't worth it. So we just allow other, other, other uh, organizations to come in and provide services that are Medicaid waiver service providers. I just want to note that what Jack has built um, in Central Florida is basically, it's called um, permanent supportive housing. It's an affordable housing community, multifamily housing development. It's definitely different from continuum of care, Benjamin's, you know, it's very different. It's definitely for individuals who can live independently with a light support coordination you know, light uh, coordination of support services. So I think we need to make sure that there is a, you know, clear distinguish. Yeah, you can, you can talk about that. Um, along the lines of threats and concerns and kind of following up, Jill, are you in the room? To what Jill was talking about in her presentation. Um, as we've seen the epidemic increase of autism and the more complex profiles associated with folks with autism, um, I'm thinking about it, I don't have a solution for this, but what we have observed is that often um, even a four bed home is very difficult to make work for four individuals, very complex behavioral profiles. So if we're talking about individual homes or two folks living together, it is a real concern of how can we fund this because in you know a fully Medicaid funded program, it's virtually impossible to make a four bed home budget work. Um, and so as we see our profile changing and more complex people being part of our adult services, I think that that's a significant part of the conversation. One opportunity too that um, I, I don't think we mentioned yet was there's a real opportunity for folks in, that are making uh, legal decisions and making laws, politicians to come into programs like yours and ours. Um, I, I think Ms. Ricordia has really exploited that opportunity. And because of that, you know, they've got this state approved continuum of care license pending in the federal government. So I, I, at Marbridge, I mean, we, we've got, I've got Duncan Murray, our nurse home administrator here, and he keeps saying, I don't think they know what they're talking about. They gotta come see what we do. And we have not been real successful getting people out there. So I think that's an opportunity in any of our communities because I think once they see it and they see the difficulties inherent in especially um, high need, special need people with autism and the way that you serve them and what it takes, I think number one, they're gonna see an effective model and number two, they're gonna see the funding needed to assure that that, that person's getting the care they need and they're getting the care they need and the choice of the home they live in. So anyone else? Um, a 
our foundation is Homes for Life Foundation in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and we actually started in 1990 with our first group home, four-person group home. I don't know why, but I just thought four was a good number. So a lot of the things we did just happened to work out in our favor along the way. At that time, the Ark of Delaware was asked by our state legislature to help expand housing because they had a lot of people that needed a group home model. So remember, it's 1990, and that's when that group home model was very popular. So Homes for Life, we decided to partner and my job was to go raise the money and get the houses built. And we have uh, staff quarters, weekend quarters, and we made them, and I have pictures of them. They're all beautiful, all in very upscaled neighborhoods. So once the house was built, the Ark of Delaware, we deeded the house to the Ark. And then the state of Delaware would then send out an RFP to service providers. So again, if you think about the regs now, just by chance, the ARC was the owner, and the state would then choose the provider. So it wasn't provider owned and operated. So that, again, was working very nicely along the way. Now, when we fast forward to the regulations, the other thing I did was I built two in each neighborhood because it was good for sharing staff, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you get to the CMS regs, then even though we would meet heightened scrutiny because not owned and operated, et cetera, uh, that was all working, but now, well, we have two houses across the street or next to each other, so we have a lot of, you know, four and four equals eight, too many, and they now want to drop the size of the homes to three. Well, how does the provider, so when they're getting paid for four, that's our big threat now. The threat now will be, yeah, when they come in to look at the heightened scrutiny. Yes, yeah. So they, if they drop it to three per home, then the agencies are going to have a lot of trouble, you know. Are there any, any solutions that you can think of or anyone in the room can think of? Our state has not been very supportive with, with the regulation. They're very... Any, any any uh, help from the partners that you've engaged with? Um, we're, you know, fighting back. And I think right now what we have will stay the same, but if someone passes away or someone leaves a group home, they're not backfilling those empty rooms. So that is a big threat to this gotcha. program. Gotcha. Thank you. Someone. James. <laughs> I do think, though, that our communities, our intentional communities, need to tell our story. I think the time that you hear about intentional communities on a national level is when something goes wrong and uh, when there's a, a, an instance of abuse, et cetera. So it paints a picture of all intentional communities. So I think we need to start telling our story, our outcomes, our the things that are going well. Um, and Great our point. outcomes are the stories of the people that we serve. Yep and how their lives are enriched by the communities in which they live. That story isn't being told, and it isn't being told to the lawmakers and the policy makers. Great point. Right behind you. I got over here. There are two at that table. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah Desens. I'm the founder and executive director of Farmsteads of New England, which is uh, located in New Hampshire. Uh, I found Farmsteads because I have a son who's on the severe end of the autism spectrum and looked at what was out there for services and decided he needs something different. Um, what we, when we started, I looked at the New Hampshire regulations and said, okay, I'm just going to do within their regulations um, despite a lot of opposition. Um, so I designed buildings, uh, residential buildings, that uh, they're about 2,000 square feet each. Um, they have four one-bedroom apartments in the corners with a common room in the middle. And what that, uh, each apartment is a true apartment with a living room, kitchenette, bedroom, and bathroom. Uh, but the common room also has a common kitchen. Uh, and what that 
enables us to do is uh, in buildings where people are uh, able to prepare their own meals, they can do their own thing in their apartment, in buildings where they're not, the staff can use the common kitchen to prepare for pe people in the building. In most buildings, we have uh, one apartment is for staff. Uh, because New Hampshire doesn't want more than three people in a certified residence. Mm -hmm. Four or more makes it licensed, and that's a kettle of fish we don't want to be in. Um, in order to make it affordable, um, what we've found is that um, because each person has their own apartment, we can have them apply for Section 8 housing vouchers. So uh, we have... Um, about two-thirds of our people at this point who have uh, housing vouchers, and that uh, is a significant help financially uh, in making it viable. Um, we have six of these buildings on the farmstead. Uh, we've got uh, uh, so 20 individuals with um, varying levels of need living on the farmstead in Hillsboro. Last year, we purchased another property in another part of the state uh, and are looking to duplicate what we did on the first farmstead. Um, so that's is, is that that's is that a real opportunity, or is the is the state looking at that as uh, oh we don't want another one of those? Oh, oh yeah. There, yeah, there are yeah. people who say they don't want it, but we've got a waiting list of almost seventy five people uh, families who want what we offer, and uh, the. State basically has, and we've go, we're going through heightened scrutiny and uh, such. You. But mm -hmm. you, you know, we're able to check off all the boxes. You know, everyone has a lease, everyone has a key, everyone you know goes grocery shopping and buys what they want and eats what they want when they want, with whom they want, where they want. Um, so I'm not. Uh, I may be overly optimistic, but I think that we're going to uh, pass the heightened scrutiny test. Um, and we're forging ahead. Congratulations. Well done. Did you, did you have a question? Nope. Yes. Uh, right. Paul Landers, Pathfinder Village. You'll hear more about us tomorrow morning. But uh, I, I think an opportunity is our diversity. You know, the way I look at it, the federal government is really just reinstitutionalizing the model. And I think the fact that all of us are different is a strength. Yep. And I think we have to figure out a way to market that, leverage that, to show that it truly, we are born from choice. <laughs> and that's a powerful concept, and I think we have to leverage that more and more. You know, listening to Ms. Harris today, you know, she really focused on the values of what this transformation is all about. And it's about the person, it's about their desires and needs, and meeting those needs and desires. And we all do it differently. So I think that's really an opportunity. And, and uh, so Together for Choice could sort of be that, that, that voice for the intentional community throughout the country so to the show that our diversity is actually a strength. Diversity. So the yeah. diversity, the number of models, the number of people I think are serving, it, yeah, of the options and choices. Absolutely. Because yeah. again, the way I look at it is they're really just reinstitutionalizing a model. Yeah, I agree. Everything's going to look the same, be the same, and people at the end of the day are going to be lonely. Yep. And, uh, and, you know, at risk. So um, I, I've always looked at, you know, I, I know many of you here, you know, Adam, in your community, in our community, in New England Village, and all these great places. I love the fact that we're all different. Yep. And uh, we should celebrate that. You know, the threats are obvious. Uh, Ms. Harris did a great job today, really, expressing those threats in a respectful way. Um, but I really, I, I think we should all think about how to, how to address that and leverage that diversity. One thing uh, uh, Mrs. Harris said was, uh, I don't think she mentioned it here as much, but they are not wanting to close places down. You know, that's, she was very clear about that. I, I know, you know we're with the government and all that, but she really wants to help people move through the process successfully and not have to reinvent the good wheel they developed to serve the population that we all serve and make sure that those choices remain um, in, in a large fashion. So, and, and it's all about treating anyone as a person, designing their career around that person, giving them choice and options. Someone over here? Go ahead. Hi there, my name is April Allen and I'm representing an organization out of 
Dallas, Texas. Uh, actually, our organization is in Plano, just north of Dallas, called My Possibilities. And um, I'd like to share our endeavor with you all. Uh, many of you that have been in this space will probably uh, love to poke some holes, <laughs> and I'd love your feedback because we are we are literally just as of a month ago uh, just closed on 180 acres of, of property uh, with. Uh, the desire to endeavor into the residential space. Um, currently, our organization uh, has been in the continuing education and vocational space. We serve near 600 individuals in North Texas um, through continuing education once they transfer out of high school, uh, and then also within the vocational space of educating on vocational services and also placement through Texas Workforce Commission. So uh, a long vision of the organization has been to get into the residential space. So. Here we are trying to uh, join forces with many of you that have been doing it to meet the um, ever so critical need of, of housing for individuals with disabilities. So uh, some of you have talked about the climate in the state of Texas. Marbridge, you, you know uh, better than anyone, the 15 year waiting list. And so we really, we're trying to figure out how do we come together to meet the need but also those individuals that do have the waiver dollars, how can we meet it within this residential community that is different than just the private pay option. Um, so our endeavor is to uh, build 300 homes within the neighborhood, um, 100 of those homes being completely owned and operated by My Possibilities, and 200 of them would be open for market. So it would be a completely inclusive neighborhood where you and I can go and buy a home there, but also if there was an individual that lived on their own with little supports up to a four bed group home could also occupy um, the neighborhood. The state has been supportive of as long as it's an inclusive neighborhood uh, where anyone can come and purchase a home that it's, it's supported through waiver dollars. But of course, <laughs> I don't wanna completely look through those rose colored glasses and uh, especially listening to Mrs. Harris today and what we're up against. And we're, we're very mindful of the uh, regulations that are coming down the pipe. And we've tried to um, stay in compliance even with our day programming. Um, so it's gonna be an interesting thing that we embark on. Uh, we do wanna operate private pay group homes as well as be a leasing agent for providers who may not have the capital to go out and buy a home uh, but we would be able to have affordable rent uh, for those providers to come in and do three and four bed group homes. So um, that's what we're embarking on. I'd love to come out and see Noah's. We've gone and visited New England Village, uh, Stewart School. There's been a few that we've, we've gone to see. Noah's uh, Homes in San Diego, they're here represented, um, partnering with them because they have such a wonderful model for um, Alzheimer's and, and individuals with um, dementia and memory loss. So we, we definitely want to address those critical issues too. So um, obviously can't do everything, but we're trying to really get into the space where we're doing it in a truly inclusive way um, that those dollars can be used. So That's great. Yeah. So, so yeah. I think we have a diverse um, <laughs> group of housing residential service providers here. So I just want to make a clear distinction between each of the housing models. When we're talking about just residential, affordable housing, Medicaid waiver, as you already know, does not pay for that. It doesn't pay for rent, it only pays for services. Um, licensed group homes may be paid by waiver money. And so I think people need to kind of understand that and not you know, rely on Medicaid agencies to make sure that these people can get into affordable housing because that's actually up to HUD and your state and city mm -hmm. government agencies. And the waiver group home housing in Texas, typically the Medicaid will pay for the services, but they also, since they're eligible for Medicaid, to get Social Security to pay for the rent. That's how it typically works. My name's Stinson Carpenter. I, uh, Rainbow Omega's organization that my wife and I founded a number of years ago. But I'm from rural Alabama. We have 350 acres. I'm from rural Alabama. We have 350 acres. Uh, my son is our inspiration for the community we have. But one of the things I was going to share with the, the group, uh, raising money to build homes or to build buildings, capital money is rather, I would say, easy. But raising money to operate is the, the big deal. Uh, I noticed you said you took no money, uh, but you have ICFs. Are they um, uh, funded with Medicaid waiver, no money to the ICF? 
the ICF. The, the ICF is like an all-inclusive fee for the bed. Okay. You know, so. But we tapped into a, a source of money. Uh, USDA, mm -hmm. um, they uh, provide money for it. We've used them to build uh, four of our homes, and they have a, a section of that called USDA Rural Development. And uh, they have built a number of homes. They also have a branch of that called... Uh, USDA uh, rural businesses. And so we also tapped into that where we've built uh, a large number of greenhouses. We've built a, a market. Uh, and so they've been behind us in building. So uh, that is an alternative. And since we've done that, uh, at first we were assumed isolated because we were rural. Mm -hmm. But now the state is talking to us about uh, using us as a model for rural homes. I mean, we're really not isolated. We just, a lot of people in Alabama live in a rural area. That's a great opportunity. <laughs> and that story can be told. I really want to see how that completes, how that ends. Um, Mark, did you have a oh. Yeah, my name is uh, Sarah, and I have a son who's uh, nonverbal autism profoundly impacted. And uh, our model is a place called Costanoa Commons Farm. And uh, we gathered together a group of, uh, we're now 12 families that all contributed money and bought seven acres of land in the city of Santa Cruz and in California. And uh, each of our kids, 10 of them, the original 10 families, have uh, profoundly uh, disabled uh, young adults, uh, quadriplegic in wheelchair, um, cerebral palsy in wheelchair, uh, that sort of uh, profoundly impacted. And uh, we are building, what five of the acres is going to be a community farm, and the farm is up and running. If you go on the website or see a Facebook, it's amazing. All of our uh, young adults out there volunteering uh, on the farm, uh, helping to sell produce, and uh, meeting with other members of the community on this beautiful piece of land. And then two of the acres is going to be housing, which will break ground in the spring. So uh, we're, of course, being very mindful of the HCBS to ensure that our individuals can uh, be provided support services in our homes. We're gonna have uh, 39 rooms uh, there will be uh, 20 uh, individuals with disabilities. And uh, to try to make it an integrated community, we are uh, very close to the downtown, but to ensure that even our little pocket neighborhood of nine homes will be integrated, that there will be uh, one that will be rentals only to a local university or anyone who hopefully will also be providing a low-income rent for providers. And there will have two families that will rent two of the neurotypical um, families that will rent two of the homes. And then the rest will be um, uh, shared housing for our individuals. Okay. And okay, there's gotten services by our local uh, Lanterman Act, that which provides supported living services to even uh, intensely impacted individuals. Thank you. We've got one time for one more. One more, and I think Mark's got a yeah. microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I appreciate it. I can't sit and talk to a group, so sorry. I'm going to stand. Um, two things uh, really quickly. They're completely different. I'm not even sure if the first one is appropriate for this group, but I'm going to put it on the table. Most of us are nonprofits, right? Your board structure and understanding every single individual on your board and their motivation is, for many of us, the difference between life and death of your organization. I've just left an organization in Ohio whose board imploded, and, and I know three other organizations, I'm not gonna name them, who have gone under massive transformation or have experienced nearly deadly consequences of not understanding the motivations of people on their boards. And unfortunately, a lot of it comes from families. So I, I throwing that out there is just, you know, we talk about factors that could influence our success. They're not all external. All right. The second thing I wanted to, to say really quickly is I'm an enormous proponent of any option, but I think we have got to work a lot more as an organization to innovate 
for solutions that are private pay only and affordable. And I believe that they can be done. I don't think they have to be thirty-five or four thousand, thirty-five hundred or four thousand dollars a month. Although, I support anybody's right to build that and anybody's right to choose to pay that to have their son or daughter live there. But I think you can get to affordable at a dollar a square foot for a seven hundred and fifty square foot apartment or a small home uh, that doesn't take any government money, no waiver money, no low income housing tax credits. I believe that it's possible. And when you look at even just in the state of Ohio, where I came from, 49,000 people on the wait list, which, by the way, they just wiped off the map because they have decided not to have a wait list. They just decided not to have it. Um, it w I, would, I would love to be part of a work group that works on finding ways to make private pay communities affordable mm -hmm. for, for the folks who aren't rich, the folks who can't get the waivers, because the government's never going to be there with it. Uh, and I think that's a critical path going forward. I have a model that I think can work in this space. Um, I just think that's essential. So I want to throw you. that out. Yeah, Thank so you, I want to mention one example of a solution that um, State of Virginia has actually done uh, in the past year. Vanguard Landing, mm -hmm. um, State of Virginia. Deborah, she's yeah. not here yeah. right now. She's at an event um, there. But what they did is they advocated at the state level with sta state legislators. Mm -hmm. And they actually passed a bill that was unanimously approved, and that bill actually honors choice. So even if a setting does not comply with the federal HCBS standard settings rule, the state is going to honor and actually pay for services. So that's kind of the solution that we would like to really think about and say, okay, you know, what can we do at the state level? For example, I know Jack and Jim and others at the state of Florida, you guys advocated for affordable housing for um, individuals with development disabilities, and you knew that going into the tax credit world, it might be very, very competitive in a way that you might not get the housing, you know, for the tax credits for DD housing. So you advocated and you got the state to carve out 5% of the total tax credits just for DD housing, right? Because California, we can't do that. We got it a you know, increase to 25% from 15%, but it's still, you know, our DD is mixed with other special needs groups such as, vet, you know, veterans, homeless, and all these other special needs populations. So we always keep losing to other special needs groups. So, you know, those are the solutions that I think would be great for you guys to really think about. What can you do at the state level? What can you do at the local level to increase opportunities for your organization and others that serve this population? And, and programs like the one that Jack founded are models to other states. I mean, and how they can do it, how it can be affordable, how can it, how, how it can fit in with an HCBS waiver. So congratulations. I think it's, it's there's some rules change in Florida too. Of course, they see a good thing. It's like, let's crush it. but. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to end here. Thank you all for your participation, and I think we're all going to gather back in this room. So take a quick break and come on back in here. We'll discuss what we've learned. Thank you.